Welcome, dear readers. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We're recording today from various locations around Winnipeg, all within Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota, as well as the birthplace of the Métis Nation and the heart of the Métis homeland. Our drinking water comes from Show Lake 40 First Nation in Treaty 3 territory. In this episode, we will be discussing Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me, a graphic novel written by Mariko Tamaki and illustrated by Rosemary Valero O'Connell. I'm Dennis from the Idea Mill, though I'm currently found at the Henderson Library, and I've just realized I'll likely never have a sandwich at a themed diner named after me. Across the screen from me is... Hi, I'm Trevor. I'm the branch head at the Louis Riel Library, and also an online advice columnist uh, who writes under the name, You're Doing It Wrong. (laughs) <laughs> and across the screen for me is... Uh, I'm Toby. I'm an outreach librarian based out of Millennium Library. And in the spirit of adolescent romance, I wanted to make a gonads and strife reference, but I couldn't quite figure out how to work it in, so I, I, I apologize for that. And I guess I'm, I'm the last one today. Last in the order, but maybe first in our listenership's hearts. Oh. I, mean, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. I have no idea who listens to this. A good book can carry me away from an ever ancient ordinary day. Yeah. So keep it down, leave me alone. Close the doors and turn off the phone. Cause all I ever really need is a little more time to read. And you, dear readers, we hope you aren't thinking about breaking up with us. Keep in touch. You can find our email address and all our social media outlets by going to wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca and scrolling to the bottom of the page. If you hang around till the end of the episode, you can enjoy our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. In a moment, Trevor will give us a summary of the book. But first, Trevor will also tell us about the author. Yeah, you know, I feel like I got off easy the last couple of episodes because two episodes ago was uh, we did short stories, George Saunders, so I didn't really do a summary. And then last month we did a memoir, so my summary was pretty much the same as the biography. So now I'm paying for it because I'm doing not only one <laughs> author bi- biography, I'm doing an author biography, an illustrator biography, and then the summary. So, uh, you know, uh, get used to hearing the timbre of my voice for the next 30 minutes. Or less, hopefully. <laughs> or less. <Yeah. laughs> the dance will have some serious editing going. Okay, here we go. This is it. Mariko Tamaki was born 1975 in Toronto. Her family tree includes Japanese, Canadian, and Jewish branches. She studied English Lit at McGill. She graduated in 1994. She's best known as a writer of graphic novels. She's collaborated with her cousin, Jillian Tamaki, on two separate works. The first one, Skim, from 2008, and This One Summer from 2014. She's written a few issues of Lumberjanes. Those ones were illustrated by Brooklyn Allen and collaborated with Steve Rolston to write Amico Superstar, which was inspired by a performance art open mic collective that Mariko participated in when she was a student at McGill. It was called Girl Spit. And because it was during the 1990s, there's very little online evidence of Girl Spit for the good or for the bad, I don't know. I couldn't find a lot of information on it, but I am curious to learn more about it. In 2016, she got called up to the majors by taking on Marvel's She-Hulk in a new series and writing a Supergirl miniseries for DC Comics called Being Super. She returned to Marvel in 2019 with a four-part series called Spider-Man and Venom, Double Trouble, and then she went back to DC in 2020 to start writing Wonder Woman. She started her own comic imprint, Shirley Comics, with the aim of publishing more comics with the 2SLGBTQ plus themes, fostering things that she wants to see out there and also working with a wealth of untapped talent. When asked about her thoughts on having some of her books challenged or banned in schools or libraries, this is what she says. I like protest. Protest is good, but protest needs to be a conversation, not just a removal of the antagonizing agent. I think it's worth having a conversation about what we do as readers, as libraries, as parents, about books that make us feel uncomfortable, about the criteria we're setting up for defining a book as inappropriate. Books don't have a nutritional value, which is to say we don't just read good books because they're good for us. We read to expand our horizons, to understand and connect with something outside ourselves, good and bad. We read to challenge ourselves. Beyond that, Part of the experience of reading is a self-selecting process where we, as readers, old and young, 
decide what we want to read or keep reading. I think to deny young readers that experience is an educational disservice. Hmm. So that's uh, Mariko Tamaki, and now uh, Rosemary Valero O'Connell, the illustrator of Lardine. She was born in Minneapolis, but she spent much of her childhood in Zaragoza, Spain, going back and forth between the States and Europe. She graduated from the, the Minneapolis College of Art and Design with a Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Comic Art in 2016. She got into the biz after an editor for First Second Comics, which is the publisher of Lordine, bought a copy of her 22-page mini-comic that she wrote and illustrated over the summer uh, from the Museum Comics and Cartoon Arts Festival. In 2020, Valero O'Connell won an Eisner Award, which is one of the top comics awards, for Best Penciler Inker for her work on Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me. And that book also won an Eisner Award in the Best Publication for Teens category. And she also won, in 2020, the Ignis Award for Outstanding Artists. When what she has to say is, When you do a comic, it's a lot of time. And it's a lot of kneading of the bread. I've made a lot of comics about grief and loss in some sort physical or emotional, and I found that there's plenty of catharsis to be found in that. Making something story-shaped makes it into something I can understand, weirdly enough. I think taking myself out of the equation and putting that extra shroud over it, for me, it allows it to become more universal and less about the specificity of my own experience, but rather asking, what about this can other people relate to? It also helps as a creator for being braver with showing parts of myself that in other situations would be unthinkable to share in casual conversation with strangers. You can read more about Valero O'Connell at her website, which is highrosemary.com, like H-I and then Rosemary. You can also see samples of some of her artwork there, including a short, poignant comic called October that I'll put a link to in the notes. And now, if you're still listening to this, this is the summary of Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me. Lordine, the most popular girl in high school, was Frederica, known as Freddie, Riley's dream girl. She was charming, she was confident, and so cute. But there's just one problem. Lordine is maybe not the greatest girlfriend. And when Freddie is with Lordine, Freddie is not the greatest friend to her pals. Reeling from her latest breakup, Freddie's best friend Doodle introduces her to the Seeker, S-E-E-K-H-E-R, a mysterious medium who leaves Freddie some cryptic parting words. She tells her, you have to break up with her. I wonder what that could mean. But Laura Dean keeps coming back, and as their <laughs> relationship spirals further out of her control, Freddie has to wonder if it's really Laura Dean that's the problem. Oh, maybe it's Freddie, who is rapidly losing her friends, including Doodle, who needs her now more than ever. Winding throughout the book is an email exchange between Freddie and online advice columnist Anna Weiss, who provides context and perspective to help Freddie navigate the messy world of being a teenager in love. Excellent. Ah, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's a lot of work there, Trevor. Well, you know, it's a work, it's a labor of love. Yes. And speaking of love, which was the main subject of the book, uh, actually, I don't have anywhere to go with that. <laughs> uh, instead, let's start with uh, our first impressions of the book. How did you guys find it? Well, this is, I hadn't read it till we read this, but I was familiar with Mariko Tamaki's work before. I, the one last summer, uh, a fantastic poignant read about childhood ending and becoming a, a young woman about these two friends at a summer camp in, in, uh, Ontario. It's, uh, it's a, such a great read. And then also she can totally switch gears. She did, um, that Spider-Man comic, Double Trouble, which is super fun because it's Spider-Man and Venom and they're living together as like almost like an odd couple roommates. And so rather than Venom being really messy, he's just kind of like this big schlub of a guy that doesn't do his dishes and he's always bothering people. And, and, uh, so, so I've loved her work. And so this, this was new to me, and I had a great time reading it, even though maybe I'm not in high school anymore. But uh, there's a lot to it that I, I connected to. There's a lot I enjoyed, but I'd like to hear what you also have to say. Yeah, I, I really liked it, too. This was my second time reading it. Um, I am a big fan of Mariko Tamaki. I've read her other graphic novels, and I just think she... She has a real way of capturing that adolescent experience um, where, like, no one understands you and I'm the only one who's ever felt these, like, really strong emotions. But she doesn't make fun of that. It's just this very compassionate, understanding view of adolescence, which I really like. And I think that's why we can relate to it so much, because it's not... 
it's not satirical. It's not like, oh, these teenagers, they think, you know, they have problems. Um, it's just very, <laughs> very real. This was my first time uh, reading Mariko Tamaki, and I really liked it. There were, uh, like you said, she doesn't make fun of anything in the story. There's no mocking of any character or their perspective or anything. It's very natural and flowing. Like, I loved the way that uh, she does dialogue. It all felt very natural, and she did not use the typical conceit of a narrator that explains away a lot of things. Like, instead of a traditional narrator, you have those snippets of the the emails between her and Anna Weiss, which lend a lot of context to things, but also don't explain anything. You have to kind of figure things out as you're reading through it, which it r treats the reader, I think, with a lot of respect in letting them figure out what's going on without having to spoon feed it to them. And uh, the characters were interesting and fun and, and relatable, even though I'm not a teen lesbian. Um, <laughs> You're not? Not anymore. No. It's been a couple <laughs> of years since I've been in high school. Uh, my high school was a lot smaller than the one that the, they went to. So a lot of the experiences were different. And yet I felt like the the chaos of the youthful mind did remind me of my own uncertainties when I was a kid uh, trying to figure things out. So yeah, I really enjoyed this one. And also I like the fact that it was, you know, a graphic novel that was easy to read uh, just a couple hours and you're done. Um, but you feel like you've got a complete story. <laughs> Well, and I like what you said, too, about how you can still relate to it, even though, yeah, we went to high school in the 80s or 90s. But to me, it felt almost like if John Hughes was still alive and making movies, this could very much, if, uh, it had a John Hughes feel to me. Just like you, even just the way, like in the early scene where there's that dance and the DJ saying, all right, we're going to be making some sweet love to your ears out there. Uh, and then the, the, the principal or the chaperone gets up and he's wearing the sweater vest and he goes, ah, uh, there will be no uh, making love out there. Sweeter other eyes <laughs> carry on. Like I, I can totally, like that was definitely from any, every high school movie, right? The square chaperone trying to tone things down. And, uh, and they have the dialogue too. Uh, it's love that one line where I think, um, Freddie asks, buddy, are you okay? And then they say, no, I'm mad. I want to be mad for a while. And I just thought, yeah. oh, yeah. You know, I just, and, and, and then the exchanges in the class between those people talking about Harvey Milk and who he was and the history. And it just seemed to be, yeah, just so natural. Like it's how people talk. She, 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 she nabbed that perfectly. To me, it felt a little bit like a better sequel to a story that had been written but never published in that, you know, the first book might have been called Laura Dean is super excellent, uh, where it's, where it's all about, you know, Laura Dean and, and Freddie coming together and then it would end with them becoming a couple, which you get flashbacks to in this story. But then this story is almost like The Emperor Strikes Back, where, uh, it, it takes place a few months after, you know, everything's great or a year or however. And then, you know, things are in chaos and things aren't as great and they're messy and, uh, and, uh, a much more interesting story than the girl meets girl, girl falls in love, a couple of little things happen and boom, they're together happily ever after. So I, I think it was interesting that Mariko, uh, focused on that part of the story. Like once the fairy tale honeymoon period's over and, uh, and she's realizing that maybe this dream girl isn't really her dream girl after all. I thought that was an interesting choice. Yeah, the relationship dynamic between Freddy and Laura Dean is, of course, one of the, the major driving forces of the story. Uh, what did you guys think of their dynamic? I mean, it's I, I totally get why Laura Dean is so popular. I mean, just she's so cool. Like, there's just something so charismatic and easy breezy and casual and just very she's she's very cool. Like, I, I, I get that. But she's a She's terrible. I mean, she's, she gaslights Freddy. She fetishizes her. And, and yet Freddy just keeps coming back. And I mean, it's, it's such that familiar, like high school relationship where, you know, one person is taking advantage of the other person and it, it felt very real, but it, it also just made me very angry. Mm hmm. Yeah, I was getting, yeah. getting so fed up with Freddie by the end of it, how she would just always drop everything and, and run over to, like, just, just blinders. I mean, you can relate to it. You know, when you're in love, you only have eyes for the other person. And uh, But, oh, as a reader, you're just like, come on. Yeah, look at your friends. Look at what you're losing. It was so toxic. And I'm glad that, you know, the story 
uh, there's some kind of uh, resolution at the end. There's a great scene, of course, towards the end where the scales fall from Freddy's eyes, maybe, if you want to say that. She goes to Laura Dean's house and has a confrontation and a uh, very satisfying scene. When I, I was a nerd in high school, and I have a kind of aversion to people who come across as really cool and so I disliked Laura Dean right from the start. Just, you know, she had the swagger, she had the, you know, the style. And, uh, to me, that type of character, I, I never liked them. I, <laughs> and I felt fully justified as, as the story progressed. And you see her do, uh, the gaslighting. Um, I think the worst one was, uh, when they had been at the art show and, uh, Freddie uh, quickly kissed uh, one of the other people she had just been introduced to and Laura finds out about it and afterwards is like, were you trying to hurt me? You know, it's like all of a sudden she's putting the pressure on Freddie. It's like, were you trying to hurt me? Was that it? And this is from someone who has done this to Freddie multiple times and keeps blowing it off and then turns it around into, see, we, we are in love even if we're kissing other people. It doesn't matter, right? And thus absolves herself of any responsibility for the times she's been cheating on Freddy. And that whole scene just made me so mad. <laughs> it's like, what a way to treat someone, to turn everything around on them and then uh, use it to make yourself the shining example of everything that's right in the relationship, which is very upsetting, but also very realistic because you see that type of thing in relationships. My, I think one of my favorite spots in the, in the book too was after the breakup at the start of the story. I think it was Buddy who was like, okay, so do you want us to spread a rumor that she has HPV? <laughs> yeah. Cause we'll do that. That's what friends it's are like, for. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, her, uh, yeah. She had a great circle of friends and she didn't even realize it. Uh, she did eventually, but, uh, well, I think she realized it, but that's one of the things about their relationship, right? Uh, Laura had her constantly hanging on, waiting for a message, waiting for a text, waiting for something. And only when she had that would she start to re-engage with her friends until the next time she was supposed to see Laura. Yeah, and she reconnected with them, but always a little bit too late. Like she'd leave, you know, doodle hanging, you know, because they were supposed to study after school. But then she would only remember later or uh, – and uh, yeah, it's just – Again, realistic, understandable, but yeah, frustrating, ugly relationship, for sure. I want to ask you guys uh, specifically about Valero O'Connell's art and what did you think of how the artwork uh, either added to or took away or changed, new, made added nuances to the, to the story? Since that's at least 50% of the story, maybe more, depending <laughs> on uh, how you feel. Yeah, I, I loved it. Um, the, the black and white with the like bursts of the kind of cool millennial pink and just the, um, the real sense of place that the drawings offer. Like it's so, it's so Berkeley. It's so California with that like California glow, the palm trees, the sky, these like hip diners, that bowling alley that was just spectacular looking. Like it was just, it really created an atmosphere. And then I also just loved the, the little details like Freddie's room or like just like a hand gripping an arm or the facial expressions, the body language. Like they just, they add so much, so much depth and so much extra meaning to, to everything. I also found, I don't know if it was the same for you guys, but the drawings also lended a certain ambiguity to things for me. Like the characters, the way that they're drawn, some of them are more androgynous than others. Like at the beginning, the first scene is like they're all in a bathroom together. Uh, and to my mind, you know, old school, I'm thinking, oh, there must be in the girl's bathroom. But Eric and Buddy were in there. And at the beginning, you don't get the characters' names either. So at the beginning, I just kind of assumed it was all girls. And it's like, oh, no, Eric's a guy. Okay, is Buddy a guy? I wasn't sure because, uh, you know, Buddy has the earrings and uh, styling has some female presenting qualities. But everyone's like, you know, uh, you know Buddy at one point is like uh, being disciplined for something. And when she's uh, when he, he's expressing this frustration later, he's like gay power. You know, it's like, okay, so Eric and Buddy are two guys? And then I think there's one point where Eric says, you know, he doesn't want to make something about his boyfriend. So it's like, oh, okay, buddy is definitely a guy. Okay. Uh, for me, you know, I just found the artwork just a little ambiguous and it left me 
uncertain in different parts. Also, I found Laura Dean was had kind of a masculine presentation. So I was just this little bit of uncertainty as I'm reading as to how everything's flowing. I think that was part of the story for me is kind of discovering people on their own merit, not merits. What am I trying to say? I was discovering the characters as they were behaving and talking and such uh, without relying on my usual stereotype of this is the guy, this is the girl, you know. And I found it interesting how that developed and how it unfolded and how it affected my perception of the story, uh, which turned out to be not a lot because the biggest part of the characters were the dynamics between them and the way they cared for each other, the way they neglected each other, things like that. But as a part of a story I'm used to having very obvious and uh, the way it was presented, it was uh, more ambiguous to me. So it kind of gave me that room to explore the characters in a slightly different way than I normally would have. Do you think that ambiguousness is uh, related to the fact that this, it's about like gay people, queer people? Yeah, it could be. I think it's one of those things where it's expectations when you're going in. And usually when you're reading a novel, it will say something like he or she or they or, you know, when you're looking at most of the graphic art, uh, graphic art that I have read, which is, to be honest, mostly superhero stuff, right? It tends to be very stereotypically, like very stereotypically masculine or very stereotypically feminine. And this was a lot more along the middle. So maybe more realistic depictions in some ways, right? But it's, it may also just be the art style. I'm not used to this particular art style. Uh, it's just a little closer to manga than uh, the Western style comics that I've usually read. So I, I just found it an interesting aspect of the artwork. I also really liked the illustrator uses a lot of very simple lines. And I have always admired this in artists who are able to convey a very realistic sense of the world, but use very simple lines to do it. It's beautiful. And I've never had that skill. So I really envy it. And when I see it done in such a like an effortless way. It, it, well, it feels effortless. I don't know how much effort it actually takes to do it because I don't have that skill set. But yeah, it uh, it was a really nice art style, and I appreciated that a lot. Yeah, this is my first experience reading or seeing any work by Valero O'Connell, and it had me then spend quite a bit of time on her website because I was just I had the same experience that Des had. I actually read through the book twice. The first time I went through, I, I had this disorienting feeling. Not only be, I wasn't uh, sure of the genders of the characters and their orientation, but even the way some of the, the, the panels were framed, it wasn't sort of your traditional um, looking straight on. It would be like the corner of somebody. or And, and uh, after reading through the story once and going back and knowing these characters, I felt a lot more comfortable. But I feel like that was probably intentional in the sense that it was it was also sort of complementing Mariko's writing because even the characters are fluid in the sense that, you know, the main character's name is Freddie, but it's really Frederica and and her best friend Doodle. I think her name is Deirdre or Dorothy or something. And honestly, I didn't know if Doodle was male or female or something for the for quite a while into the story, because there is that ambiguous nature which Again, like you said, that it kind of uh, then strips away your preconceptions of, oh, this is the boyfriend, this is the girlfriend, this is, you sort of relate to the characters on their behavior and their actions quicker than how they appear. And I don't know if you guys noticed this, maybe this is just me imagining things, but I found that the way that uh, Valero O'Connell drew Vi, who was the the woman that was working in all the different shops and was sort of like a uh, <laughs> kind of like a, a role model figure. Someone that's just a little bit older than Freddie that could kind of show her perspective and context and show her things get better. Uh, I found it was really interesting the way that uh, Valero O'Connell drew Vi because when we first see her at that uh, donut shop when Freddie pukes everywhere, she looked to me like a middle aged kind of woman, you know, working behind the counter, uh, just the way she was drawn. And then later on, when you see Vi with her friends, she's shown almost like um like a teenager. And I don't know if it's my perception, but it was it sort of was interesting that she she looked differently depending on the context of where you saw her, whether she was working behind a counter or with her friends. And then when she went out to the uh, the art show, she was dressed you know beautifully. Like it was just she seemed like a chameleon to me the way that uh, Valero O'Connell drew her. And I don't know if that was just 
something I thought or whether you noticed the way that she kind of morphed depending on the scene that she was in, which I thought was really cool. That and then going back and reading it a second time, I always recognized her as Vi, but she definitely had a different uh, vibe about her depending on where, where we encounter her. So. I think that ambiguity was about her age, especially was definitely somewhat intentional because uh, you have the scene where Freddie's like, uh, how old are you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm way too old for you. Yeah. What? So you're like 25? No, I'm 18. <laughs> it's like, yeah, with her, she had a lot of wisdom and, um, confidence. Great personality. I loved that character a lot. And, uh, with that kind of, a a person, it really is hard to tell how old they are sometimes because, you know, that type of confidence and uh, personality at 18 is not that common. I mean, she was a very confident young woman and brought a lot to Freddie's life and, and the story. So, yeah. I just want to make one shout out to one particular panel in the book. It was page 144. And you'll remember the scene. It's when uh, Freddie goes to Laura Dean's birthday and she thinks it might just be the two of them there. And then all these other people show up. It's this big party and they're all kind of older and cool. And it's just Freddie sitting on the couch uh, surrounded mm-hmm. by people. And yet, She's utterly alone. And I just thought it was just captured so perfectly. I, I just, when I saw that panel, first of all, I could relate to that, the idea of feeling mm-hmm. totally alone in a room of people sometimes. Uh, but also just the way it was drawn, it, there didn't have to be any uh, speech bubbles to tell us what was happening. It was just perfect. So needless to say, I'm now a huge fan of Valero O'Connell's work and, uh, I'm looking forward to reading other things and, uh, that she's worked on. So. I got to ask you guys about something that I couldn't figure out in the story. So Freddy and Doodle, they take apart stuffed animals and sew them back together in different ways, right? It's like a thing they have together and it's cute and quirky, right? Uh, And sometimes those little stuffed uh, creations would have little spots of dialogue here and there. I feel like they're supposed to represent something like there's some meaning in there. And I can't quite put my finger on it. Do you guys have any ideas? I was worried about this coming up because I was, (laughs) (laughs) I was similarly confused. I mean, I thought, I thought it was cute. And I, I, I think about sort of like a hearkening back to childhood when you have like a really deep relationship with like your stuffed animals and, and it feels like you can have these conversations with them and it's just a very, very comforting thing. And so I thought maybe there was something there, but, um, I was, I was perplexed as well. I mean, it, it doesn't have to mean anything. True. Uh, I, I, I share the both of yours confusion and, uh, yeah, I, I thought, like I thought it was cute. The only thing I could think was that it could mean that like Freddie and Doodle, they have this long history together and that their friendship, their platonic friendship is almost like a, like there's an alchemy there that's, that's magical that creates these like an extra world. It's kind of like when you play make believe with your friends and things and, and that magic that comes together then creates these little moments. But sometimes it would happen when either Doodle wasn't there. So I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I can't really make much sense of it. Hmm. Well, good to know I'm not alone then. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun hobby though. I, I might want to take it up myself. Yeah. I've, uh, when she said that at the beginning, something like, uh, I like to make things out of other things. I didn't realize what that meant. Um, and I've never seen anybody do that before. So I thought, yeah, that's an interesting approach to take. Uh, and I can see the appeal to it. Uh, yeah. Frankenstein. Uh, towards the, yeah. <laughs> like, like when, uh, when, uh, Freddie asked Doodle, Oh, you know, did the guy have a beard? Uh, and she goes, I don't know why. Goes, well, otherwise, this would be really weird. It was like a Santa Claus <laughs> little, you know, the, yeah. or gnome or some kind of thing she put together. So, yeah. The other thing that uh, Freddie did that I've never done was she went to seek advice from people she didn't really know. Like uh, she went to Anna Vice, an internet advice columnist, and the seeker uh, was like kind of a psychic, although it didn't really say that she was a psychic, but she was using like ruins uh, before she offered her advice. You guys ever gone for outside advice like that to an advice columnist or someone who does it professionally? 
I mean, maybe it was just, maybe it's a teenage thing, but when I was a teenager, I was very into tarot cards. I was very into Wicca. You know, my friend and I would go to this store and look at all the crystals. And so I was, I was much more open to that sort of thing than I am now, which is maybe just a, I don't know. I don't think it's a quality of youth because there's a lot of adults who are, who are very into spiritual, psychic, para, whatever things. I mean, and I guess like with, with the characters in this book, they're online in a way we never were as teenagers. Um, and there's just more things available to them. Sure, psychics were available to us, but we would have had to like actually go out into the world to find them. We couldn't just sort of type on our computer and, oh, there's one, you know, down the block and I take this bus to get there. And, and so I think maybe this is also just, a bit more of of a more connected internet time. Yeah, and there's sort of an anonymous quality to it too, especially like when you just type to Anna Vice or uh, or even like the seeker who you don't know, as opposed to asking someone that really knows you and you know them for advice. It would be a different quality. But yeah, I've never really sought advice about anything. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's probably a value in getting an objective, like disinterested third party to give you advice on a life problem. I've just never felt comfortable doing it. So I haven't ever like done it. So I found that an interesting aspect of the story as well. And that the advice I think was useful from both sources that she got it from. They both gave her something that helped put everything into context and, and kind of ended up in the decision that uh, Freddie makes at the end where she finally does break up with Laura instead of the other way around. And Laura's reaction to it, I think, was, uh, I think, justified the, uh, her decision, too. Like, it was just, an, there, there were a lot of red flags in that relationship, uh, controlling aspects, um, dismissive aspects of the relationship. I think it could be described as an abusive relationship, not in a physical way, but there were definitely emotionally abusive tactics used in the relationship. Yeah, I felt, um, Laura's reaction to getting broken up with, I was, I was quite shocked by it actually, because prior to that, she's very like, yeah, whatever, cool, you know, it's, a, it's all good. Oh, I'm going to go. Like she was just so laissez faire. And then to just explode, um, with a big F you, like I never cared about you anyway. Like it was, it was quite, uh, it was quite shocking. And, and she seemed to have tears in her eyes too at the end there. Like, uh, like this affected her emotionally in a way their relationship never really seemed to. Because she seemed very much like a, like you said, a take it or leave it lazy fair type. It's like, okay, well, now we're making out. Okay. Now, bye. Got to do some other stuff. Didn't seem like she was really deeply invested in the relationship. But at the end, she's not only mad, but crying about being dumped. Like, that can't happen to me. Like, <laughs> how dare you break up with me? I'm the one who breaks up, you know. Well, before we continue on, uh, any final thoughts about the story? There's so much here. Like, we never talked about sort of queerness in, in the story. I mean, I thought the parents were really interesting. We can talk about that stuff. We can leave it. It's No, let's dive in. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I really like how queerness is dealt with in this book. It's not, it's not part of the plot. It's not a story about coming out or coming to terms with being queer. It's just, it's, it's just what it is, you know, in the same way that straightness never has to be explained. And you do have, you know, the bits about Harvey Milk, um, the diner boss who kind of remembers when it wasn't easy to, to be queer, you know, her parents kicked her out. As opposed to the super understanding parents in this book who, like, um, Freddie's dad even thinks Laura is cool. And that line when Freddie asks Doodle, like, was your dad mad about you being pregnant? And she's like, why would he be mad? Like, it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's remarkable. And it, yeah, I just thought that was really, really neat. Yeah, it's true. When I think back to like uh, a similar kind of situation in stories from the 80s and 90s, the fact that Doodle was pregnant and looking at uh, ending the pregnancy would have been the main dramatic thrust. And that would have been the deep soul searching, uh, painful part of the story. And it was like, it's not like it was blown off here. 
it was a serious topic, but it was treated with support and love as opposed to, you know, like I say, in the 80s, that would have been, you know, parents rejecting the child and, and uh, that would have almost been a given in a lot of situations. The, the type of support and love you saw here is very uplifting because even with that love and support, it's still a difficult situation for uh, Doodle to deal with and for Freddie to deal with as her friend. And I did like a lot the uh, callbacks uh, to how the the struggle that it takes to get to the point where you, you have this kind of support and uh, acceptance in the school and in, amongst their friends and everything, like referring to Harvey Milk. Um, and also, I, I love the diner boss. <laughs> Who was like, uh, well, well, why isn't this person as special? It's like, well, she didn't come out, uh, you know. And it's like, well, she did come out. And it's like, yeah, that speech wasn't coming out. <laughs> it's like, yeah. My she favorite with that was Jodie Foster. I don't, I don't totally. know. Yeah, that's yeah, what I okay. thought too. Right. And you I was so? when I was going through, I was trying to figure out who all the sandwiches were named for, you know, because <laughs> like, you know, there's old Ellen and new Ellen. So that's, you know, from <laughs> Ellen DeGeneres and then Ellen Page, now Elliot Page, I'm thinking. And then there was, is there a Lily? I think a Lily Tom, like it was interesting. And Wanda, I'm thinking maybe Wanda Sykes. Like I, I, I tried to kind of put them all together, but I like how they never really explained it. Uh, yeah. It's kind of like an, I'm in- assuming free, the Frida was Frida Kahlo. Okay. Yeah. The artist. Yeah. I'm not sure. That was the only one that I really got. I didn't get any of the others. <laughs> yeah. No, it was great. And and I think, Toby, what you said, too, about how the, the queerness in it was not like a big statement. It was just this is this is who these characters are. And this is not the thrust of the story. It just happens to be that these characters are this way. And I think that was part of the maybe the disorienting thing for me when I started reading it was because the story didn't fall into the sort of the preconceived gender roles and things. But then as soon as I got past that, then I was sort of like, oh, this is refreshing that, that we can we can in, get to know these characters as people and, and not as stereotypes. And um, yeah, it was a, kind of a nice thing. And when the other thing, too, is that you, you, even despite having supportive parents and, uh, and a good core circle of friends, you could still tell that there was, you know, homophobia and bullying. There's that one scene, you know, where Freddie overhears the gym teacher talking about something and she never quite gets what it is but it sounds like buddy was being you know bullied or some kind of you know anti-gay slur during gym class and uh so there we're not there yet as society it was pointed out you know that we're there's still a struggle and and uh despite great gains that we've made as a society and being uh welcoming diversity that there there's still work to be done yeah i thought that was all handled really well and it was, like you say, it was all backdrop. It was all context for the story, but not the main thrust of the story. And also, I think when Eric and Buddy were having their conversation about why Eric didn't want Buddy to come to his 90-year-old grandma's birthday party, you know, and they were such a great couple. Like, you know, they were literally the most in love couple in the entire story. They were uh, fantastic. But uh, that doesn't mean that every aspect of the relationship is easy, uh, that they don't have struggles and disagreements that center around their sexuality. It's it's still something that everyone is processing and working through, just like every other aspect of life. There was a lot of stuff in here, which also makes it kind of remarkable how easy it is to get through the book, how much it flows and how easy and quick it is to read, but you can still get a lot of different material out of it, a lot of different uh, themes and ideas. It was a masterfully written and illustrated book. I'm glad we all liked it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So then uh, we will move on to our segment, lovingly entitled, Can You Tell Me a Book I Would Also Like? Who would like to recommend another book? Um, I can go. I'm excited about this one. Ah. Um, So I'm I'm a new reader of romance. It's not a genre I read until a few years ago. And um, the gateway book that got me reading romance was a book called Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. And it's a love story between the first son of the United States, so the president's son, and a prince of England. Think like Prince Harry. And um, I think when most people think of romance, people who don't read romance, when they think of romance, they think of it in like sort of historical romance terms, like the heaving bosoms and the ripped bodices and like the Bridgerton Fabio type romance. 
Um, but red, white, and royal blue is, it's contemporary. It's nothing like that. It's, it's really smart. It's witty. It's fun. It's just a delight to read. But that's actually not the book I want to recommend. I want to recommend. <laughs> Very um, <laughs> sneaky. You're going you're to get two book recommendations. In. I want to recommend nice. Casey McQuiston's new book, um, which is called One Last Stop. Uh, it just came out and, um, it is also a queer love story, um, between two women, August and this woman named Jane who is kind of like a time traveler from the 1970s who's somehow stuck in contemporary New York. I haven't finished it yet, so I, I don't know the finer details of the plot, but like Red, White, and Royal Blue, it's just, it's super fun um, and a delight to read. And I think of reading romance as kind of the purest form of reading. Like you're not reading to enrich your life in any meaningful way. You're just <laughs> reading for pleasure. And um, that reminds me of something you said at the beginning, Trevor, books don't have a nutritional value. You know, it's like, it's like eating dessert. Like it's not particularly good for you, but it's just really delicious. Um, <laughs> and so uh, also just like a great summer beachy read. So one last stop, Casey McQuiston. Excellent. Nice. Write that down. For my uh, alt book that you will also like if you enjoyed Laura Dern. Laura Dern! Oh, I, I, I told myself was I was gonna not going to say Laura Dern. It was going to happen. <laughs> Laura Dean. Oh. It's called Follow Your Arrow by Jessica Verdi. Jessica Verdi is a uh, YA novelist. And this book in particular just came out this year. It's fairly new. It's about two high school well, it's mostly about um, this girl, C.C. Ross, and her girlfriend, Sylvie. The two of them are a very cool, hip, online, internet-influencing couple. Uh, they're social media influencers, and they go by the hashtag CV, which is a portmanteau of their two names. But what happens, though, is that Sylvie breaks up with C.C., and uh, so not only does she lose her first love, but she is also worried about losing her followers and what uh, cancel culture might mean to her uh, social media presence. Then Cece meets Josh, who goes to another school, and he professionally has no interest in social media. He has no idea that she's a big deal on Instagram and uh, doesn't care, doesn't know anything about it. And um, Cece is, becomes interested in Josh, and uh, which isn't a huge surprise to Cece because she's always identified as uh, bisexual. But what is a surprise to her is, is how much she is now trying to hide her social media presence from Josh. And, and he, as we all know, things are going to go sideways when you try to keep those two worlds apart. And it's a fun read. Uh, it's um, at the end of each chapter, there are little sort of uh, social media like uh, posts from different people that kind of summarize what's happened in the chapter before. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good read uh, for people that enjoyed Laura Dean. It's called Follow Your Arrow by Jessica Verdi. I, I love the aspect of social media complicating a romantic relationship. It's uh, it's very now. <laughs> so I don't normally read stories of young romance or graphic novels that don't involve two sides punching each other a lot. So uh, instead of recommending something I've read, I'm going to recommend a title I found on Novelist. And the one I'm recommending is Bloom by Kevin Panetta. So now that high school is over, Ari is dying to move to the big city with his ultra-hip band if he can just persuade his dad to let him quit his job at their struggling family bakery. Though he loved working there as a kid, Ari cannot fathom a life wasting away over rising dough and hot ovens. But while interviewing candidates for his replacement, Ari meets Hector, an easygoing guy who loves baking as much as Ari wants to escape it. As they become closer over batches of bread, love is ready to bloom, that is, if Ari doesn't ruin everything. Writer Kevin Panetta and artist Savannah Ganesho concoct a delicious recipe of intricately illustrated baking scenes and blushing young love, in which the choices we make can have terrible consequences, but the people who love us can help us grow. It uh, sounds like a really good story. And now... It's time for everyone's favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, in which we share our love of the written word by totally obsessing about a particular word or phrase. So, who's got a good word? 
I could go. Uh, it's, I'll leave it up to you guys, to whether it's a good word or not. Um, I came across this word for the first time mid-June when I was attending the MLA-SLA Joint Library Conference this year. Due to COVID, it was online. But despite that, I found it was an excellent conference, lots of very interesting speakers and thought-provoking discussions. One of the sessions dealt with studying how misinformation spreads. And there's actually a branch of science that studies, uh, it's a scholarly study of ignorance. It's called agnotology. It comes from the uh, Greek agnosis, not knowing, which I think doesn't say, but probably where the, where the term agnostic comes from. Same, same mm-hmm. root word. And so specifically, it's the study of uh, deliberate culturally induced ignorance or doubt. This term was first seen in the mid 90s by Stanford University professor Robert Proctor and linguist Ian Boyle. Uh, And the example they would use was the tobacco industry at that time, trying to, or uh, manufacturing doubt as to the cancerous and other adverse effects of tobacco use and intentionally trying to put information out there. And since then, the whole idea of uh, climate change, people that uh, believe that it's uh, happening, that it's not, comes across... uh, they, they distinguish between two, the terms unknowledge and ignorance. So, for example, old world map makers, they would put terra incognita in the corners of the known world, uh, which then would sort of discount those areas of the world that were not on the map and maybe more importantly, discount the people that were already living there. It enabled colonialism to flourish. It also yes, is a study of, of how things don't happen, which to me is just like, how can you build a a body of knowledge based on not knowing? Uh, But it's out there. And so it kind of made me think of, you know, the early 2000s. We could take our mind back to that simpler time when we're all just dealing with the war on terror. And Donald Rumsfeld had that famous quotation that was, you know, reports say that something hasn't happened are always interesting to me, because as we know, there are no knowns there are things that we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things that we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And if one looks throughout the history of our country and other free countries, it is the latter category that tends to be the difficult ones. So there was an interesting analogy about uh, a campfire. And if you want to think of the campfire, the light from the campfire is our known knowledge. And then the bigger and the darkness around the campfire is what we don't know we don't know and so the bigger the campfire gets the more knowledge that we have generated the bigger the circumference of the circle which means the more questions are raised the more we think we know so anyway and to quote the notorious big if you don't know now you know that's (laughs) agnotology (laughs) excellent that's a good one Um, I can segue from campfire into my word. Very short and sweet today. I I didn't have tons of time to think about this. But my word is inflammable, which means flammable. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. I just, it's always something I found so absurd and um, very funny. So I just, there you go, inflammable. Beautiful. Yeah. That was very informational, which <laughs> means formational. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Only works with certain words. I like that one. So my nerd word for this month is justify. Like many words, justify has multiple meanings. Merriam-Webster offers three primary definitions. The first is to prove or show to be just, right, or reasonable, which is the meaning we'd use when describing Freddie's attempts to justify her relationship with Laura Dean. The second is to judge, regard, or treat as righteous and worthy of salvation, which is a meaning you typically hear in a church service. But today I'm talking about the third meaning, to space lines of text so that the lines come out even at the margin. (laughs) Now, I've always loved creating documents. When I was young, that meant a typewriter. But when I was in high school, we got a Commodore 64 computer, and I purchased word processing software that had the ability to justify text. Essentially, the computer adds extra spaces between words so that the end of each line of text goes right to the margin. 
and this was super exciting to me. Straight lines have a certain beauty, and being able to justify text means you can have straight lines down each side of the page, rather than uneven, ragged right edge I'd always come to accept with the typewriter. It looks so professional, like a magazine. For many years, I would always full justify my text for any essays I had to write for school. Unfortunately, justifying text has a problem. Those extra spaces within each line can look a little awkward, especially if you're using a large font size or have narrower columns of text. And in some situations, you end up with little rivers of white space in the middle of your text, and they can be visually distracting. The longer your text, the more likely these rivers of white space will appear and distract from the appearance of your document. So I eventually came to my senses, stopped trying to justify my text. While straight lines can be beautiful, I have come to embrace the uneven raggedness of unjustified text, and I feel like that idea, at least, is fully justified. (laughs) I've never thought about the fact that justify is used in Word documents and how weird that is. So thank you for that. And now I've got the song Justify My Love stuck in my head (laughs) for Madonna for some weird reason. So that's going to go for the rest of the day. Yeah, and for typographic reasons, that would just mean putting more spaces between the letters. (laughs) Uh, Which is probably not what Madonna was singing about. But I would totally dig a song that was using it that way. (laughs) Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this month. Thank you so much for joining us, dear readers. For next month, we're reading The Huntress by Kate Quinn. A trio of Nazi hunters, a lethal Nazi murderer, a Russian bomber pilot, and a gentle and quiet family where something just doesn't seem right. This historical novel is set during and just after World War II and has been described as compulsively readable by the Washington Post. Have an idea about what we should read next? Let us know. You can find all of our contact info at the bottom of the page at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. You can also find all of our past episodes and discussion questions there, too. If you haven't already, subscribe to Time to Read on your favorite podcasting service and maybe leave us a review. Tell your book-loving friends about us, too. And until next time, make sure you find Time Time to to read. Read.